of you have seen the sign of the fish somewhere? Somewhere on somebody's car or in their window at their house? Or, you know what the fish stands for? And do you know why? That's the main thing. A fish, the, the word fish in Greek is ichthus. Can you say that? Ichthus. Kind of icky, but it's ichthus. And so they took the letters from each of, from each of the letters from that, and it says, it says, Jesus Christ, God's Son and Savior. That's what ichthus stands for, and that's why the fish became the symbol of the Christian. Yeah, so the fish today, when we see it, we know that that person who's either driving the car or lives in that house, they're Christians. Yeah, they're ichthus. Yeah, Jesus Christ, Son of God and Savior. Yeah, so I have one of these for each of you today that tells you what it is, the Greek word for it, and all of that. And here, I'm going to give you one, too, so you can color it, maybe, or something. Put eyes on it and a mouth, whatever you'd like. And, and, and also, I have something else for you to remind you that these were fish, and they remind you of Jesus, okay? See, these are fish, and we want you to wait until after church to eat these, okay? Okay, I'll give that to you. Would you like that? And we'll wait till after church to open it, okay? Because we don't want crumbs all over the church. Yeah. <laughs> you don't make crumbs, do you? No. Well, anyway, let's have prayer and thank God that... Yeah? Well, that's good. Let's thank God that he gave us an indication of who the Christians are around us. That is the sign of the fish. I had it kind of upside down. Anyway, let's pray, shall we? Father, we thank you for those in our world who are not ashamed to be called Christians. And they want to tell everyone that they are. And I pray that you will bless us as we tell everyone that we are too. And that we can tell them things about Jesus and how he loves us. In his name we pray. Amen. <music>
Our scripture uh, is from John chapter 6, verse 40. And this is the will of him who sent me. Jesus is talking here, who sent me, that everyone who sees the Son, he's talking about himself, and believes in him may have everlasting life, and I will raise him up at the last day. What a wonderful promise he's given us there. Father, we just thank you for the Son that came, gave his life, and then has promised all of us life eternal. I pray that you will bless us today as we study more in the book of Revelation and learn more about your love to us and the, uh, the preparation that you have given us in the book of Revelation for that great day when Jesus will come again. In his name we pray. Amen. I titled the sermon today, A Horse of a Different Color. <laughs> Because we have four horses, and they're all different colors. We studied the first horse last week, but it is a fact that God used Daniel in the Old Testament to tell us about the history of the nations of the world. There were four major, major nations. Remember Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, and then Rome, and then the other nations of Europe that came out of Rome, signified by the iron and clay in the, in the feet. God used the statue of this man, just a statue of this man in a dream to King Nebuchadnezzar to symbolize the nations, those four nations uh, in the book of Daniel. Each time, however, that God spoke about those nations, he got more specific. 
uh, in uh, Daniel 2, for instance, God gave the image of this man and just uh, gave us, kind of introduced the four nations, Babylon, the head of gold, and the silver was uh, Medo-Persia, and then we had Greece as the, the thighs and hips of, of bronze, and iron legs signifying Rome. Oh, those four kingdoms. Uh, but then in chapter 7, uh, just uh, three or four chapters later, he gets more specific about these kingdoms. And he says that they came out of, uh, of the sea, out of water. Uh, and the detail, that detail was left out in, the, in chapter 2. And it was an important uh, detail. The waters represent masses. The waters represent masses of people. Multitudes from every nation and tribe and language group on earth. So we can understand what was the populated area of Daniel's time. Well, it was Asia and Europe. And so we need to understand that these nations, these four nations, Babylon, Medo, Persia, Greece, and Rome, came out of Europe and Asia, the po highly populated parts of the world. And so uh, we know these beasts uh, in Daniel 7 came up out of the sea. They came up out of the sea. Daniel didn't tell us that, or God didn't tell Daniel that in chapter 2. But he has four beasts now in chapter 7 that represent uh, those same four kingdoms. Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, and Rome. And he says that they came up out of the water. Waters represent uh, highly populated areas. So now we know that these beasts came up out of the part of the world that was highly populated. And this is important for us to understand because later on in the book of Revelation we're, be got, we're going to be talking about uh, the United States in Bible prophecy. And that will come uh, later in the book of Revelation as I mentioned. The book of Revelation speaks a lot about white. The, the color white. There are white robes and there's white hair and, and there's white garments and a white throne and white cloud and a white stone. We know that white was a symbol of purity or righteousness. Uh, the scenes change from heaven to earth between chapters 5 and 6 of Revelation. So last week we talked about the scenes in heaven and what a glorious scene it was. The angel choir, a hundred million strong. Jane, you missed that. It was wonderful to hear those angel, <laughs> angels singing. And there were thousands and thousands on top of that. We don't even know how many angels there were. Uh, another important distinction <clears throat> in Daniel's visions and dreams had to do with the politics of the nations. Daniel dealt with politics more than he dealt with the church. In the book of Revelation, we deal more with the church. And sort of its, uh, I don't know, attraction or its magnetism uh, into, morphing into parts of the, the political scene too. So we'll talk about that. When Jesus comes back again, we are told, talking about white again, we are told in uh, Revelation 19, I saw heaven's door open and a rider on a white horse come galloping down to the earth. The name of the rider was Faithful and True. Well, who is that? But Jesus himself. With righteousness, he judges and he makes war. Uh, he makes war out of righteousness. Um, so what his, his war is a righteous war. Uh, white is also the color designated to that first church that we talked about last week, the church of Ephesus. That church sent the gospel message to, to the entire inhabited world of that day. As a matter of fact, Paul tells us in Colossians, this is the gospel that you heard and that has been proclaimed to every creature under heaven and of which I, Paul, had become a servant. Every creature of the inhabited world of his day had heard the message. The church was faithful to God in every way for many, many years. And the news about Jesus was preached to millions of people. As a matter of fact, we're told by some that there were five million people who accepted Jesus uh, by the end of the first century. Five million. So that church of Ephesus is symbolized by the white the color white, uh, the white horse with the rider holding a bow, which symbolizes power. 
and he had arrows strapped on his back, and he had a crown, which symbolizes victory he was wearing on his head. The arrows were sharp tips. They weren't out to kill people, but they were out to kill false teachings that the people were proclaiming and people were listening to, and that certainly was accomplished in that first century. Uh, from 31 after, uh, after the beginning of the church till about 100 A.D. Uh, John Pauline, who has done a truly in-depth study of the book of Revelation, speaks about the four horsemen in Revelation, and he makes it clear that the symbolism of the four horsemen fits fairly well into the reality of Christian history. At the beginning, there is a rapid expansion of the gospel. That's the first seal. That is uh, the the church of Ephesus. Then there is a, a long period of persecution, division, and compromise. That's the second horse. With the fall of the Roman Empire came the political dominance of Christendom. But with that came the loss of the clear understanding of the gospel in the Dark Ages, the third and fourth horses. So the, horse, the four horsemen seem to fit a pattern of Christian history in at least a general way. Uh, when we think of the success of that first church, the church of Ephesus, we have, to, we have to come to the conclusion that it made the devil, Satan, angry. He was out to get the church. Satan will do anything he can to slow down that horse that first horse, and stop it altogether if he can. From the book titled The Seer of Patmos, I read, victory was written upon every move of the disciples. Boy, if we could just say that about ourselves. Victory was, was written upon our lives. In prison, with their backs lacerated, their songs of praise and thanksgiving brought victory and resulted in the conversion of souls. Peter was sentenced to death shut up in the inner prison. But that last night in prison was a victory for the angel of the Lord brought deliverance. Remember the angel came and, and uh, put, <laughs> I think the angel put everybody to sleep, all the guards, and the, the chains fell off and they walked right out of the prison. The doors fell open. Truly wonderful was the story of the gospel during that first century as I went forth, con- as it went forth conquering and to conquer. The seer of Patmos. Haskell uses the symbol of a tree uh, with the limbs growing out from the bough of this tree and growing in every direction beyond boundaries, this tree. And that's kind of the way the church was, that first church, the church of Ephesus, spreading the gospel throughout the world. But now we go from a pure white horse or the pure church, if you know nothing about Revelation, we're going to a red horse now. And if you don't know anything about Revelation, what would red kind of conjure up in your mind? Well, it's bloodshed, it's war, it's, uh, you know, it, it's just, uh, you know, we paint the devil red. When you see pictures of the devil, lots of times he's red. I don't, I, I don't know, I guess like we have the red devil pizza. You ever heard of red, De- red devil fish? We have red devil energy drink. I don't know if I drink that. Not with the devil's name on it. The second seal comes soon after the apostles have passed away. And that is about 100 A.D. All the apostles are gone. Those that started the church now, the the Christian church, have all passed away. They're gone. Uh, The second seal goes like this. As the Lamb revealed the events of the second seal, the second living being said to me, Come, look. I looked and saw a red horse galloping into the future. Its rider had a sword in his hand. He waged war against God's people who refused to compromise to have peace. I saw people being killed and family members turning against each other as the conflict continued to spread. This is the second phase of the history of the opposition to the gospel. So Satan knows only one way to hinder the gospel, and that is, of course, through persecution and death. He saw that Christianity was conquering paganism and and all the other forms of false religion, false false worship. The time period is about 100 to 313 A.D., give or take a few years there because there's some overlap. It was a time of terrible persecution. 
aimed at the Christian church. Nothing could better describe this period than a horse that was colored red because of the blood that was shed. Uh, Amazing Discoveries tells us this. The second seal, when the faith and devotion of the church became corrupted, it lost the power of God to carry the gospel forward to victory. It then began to use the power of the state. I want you to see kind of what's happening here because the power of the state and the church are kind of coming together. They're kind of melt, melding together. Uh, uniting with the dragon. <laughs> the dragon, of course, pagan Rome controlled by Satan. The dragon in uh, Revelation is Satan himself. The serpent, the dragon, that old serpent called the devil. To persecute dissenters. The phrase, the phrase kill one another, talks about the persecution during this era. The great sword that was that the horseman carries represents this war and bloodshed from Isaiah 3 and Chronicles and Acts. The second seal represents the period of 100 to 323 AD, just as the second church did, ending with the conversion of Constantine. It also depicts the compromise that began in this period when errors arose and worldliness came into the church. During the period, during this period, the church and the state began to work together. Now, what do we mean by the state? We mean politics. Politics in the church, uh, uh, the, the politics that ran the country uh, rather than the church. And uh, errors began to arise in the church. Worldliness came in. The ecclesiastical power, that is the power of the church, uh, began to uh, unite with the secular power, the political powers of the day. And Uriah Smith writes, troubles and commotions were the result. Uh, We've heard, of course, of the Roman emperor named Constantine. Constantine's mother was a Christian. Constantine's mother was a Christian, but Constantine did not become a Christian until later in life. Uh, He had been a sun worshiper most of his life, and when he became a so-called Christian, things really began to change in the Christian church. Uriah Smith continues, the spirit of this period perhaps reached its climax as we come to the days of Constantine, the first so-called Christian emperor, whose Conversion to Christianity in AD 323 brought about a compromise between the church and the Roman Empire. The Edict of Milan in 313 is said to have granted toleration to Christians and allowed conversions to Christianity, evidently from paganism uh, and all the other false forms of worship. Uh, And so uh, these were allowed to become Christians. Many people today are tortured if they become Christians. Did you know that? There are people, there are places in this world, Muslims for instance, who if they become Christians they, and, and they get caught, uh, they are punished, they are tortured. Some of them die. As Bill mentioned a while ago on Adventist World Radio, they're discovering all kinds of people who are dying because of their religion, uh, because they've converted to Christianity. Uh, there are many descriptions of this period of time by a lot of different Christian writers. Uh, One of those was Kenneth Latteret. He is a historian who wrote that the acts immediately preceding and culminating in the Edict of Milan still remain the most significant of the many milestones in the road by which the church and the state moved toward cooperation. Christianity. This is... This is a very revealing sentence and paragraph to me. Christianity, by bringing the church into existence, listen to this, developed an institution which in part was a rival of the state. You see, the state was getting kind of jealous. It created a society within the empire which so many believed threatened the very existence of the latter, that is, of the state. The conflict was very marked in the century or more before Constantine. When Constantine made his peace with the faith, however, it long looked as though the conflict had been resolved by the control of the church by the state. Yet, even in the days of the seeming subordination of the church to the government, listen to this, 
Ecclesiastics, that is church governance, sought to influence the politics of the state of the latter. Uh, what an insight and revelation this guy brings. To me, <laughs> the government of the church and the government of the nation are, are just combining. It's like a magnet. And it takes us to the horse of a different color. We are now leaving the red horse, and we're going to a horse that's even blacker. As a matter of fact, it's black. It's the black horse. It's a dark. Again, if you did not know the book of Revelation, and you had to guess about the black horse, what would that be? Uh, Haskell again writes, to live a spiritual life requires a ceaseless climbing, higher and still higher, but humanity is prone to take an easier part. Sad as it may seem, we find the church which for years sacrificed its life for the sake of the gospel beginning to compromise the truth of God. The church turned its eyes from Christ and was allured by the world into strange paths. What Satan could not do through persecution, he accomplished through flattery. So, this is a time, uh, the black, the, the black t time of history is when really a lot of corruption started coming into the church. It's, uh, it's uh, I heard Doug Batchelor say, <laughs> I heard Doug Batchelor say uh, just last week, um, he said, if Satan cannot destroy the church from the outside, he will destroy it from the inside by becoming a member. Yeah. By becoming a member. What's he mean by that? Well, he means that there are people who are inside the church who can start complaining about certain things, maybe insignificant things, begin to act like Satan did in heaven and whispering little things, you know, about their discontent they have about the church, maybe the sermons what Pastor Bob preaches, uh, maybe the music or the Sabbath schools or the social activities, and soon the church is split from the inside. Uh, I remember when I was a kid, there was a communist uh, dictator by the name of Khrushchev. And he said about America, he said, we won't have to have war against America because it'll destroy itself from the inside. Wow. <laughs> what a, what a uh, prophecy. I looked and saw a black horse galloping into the future. His rider was holding a pair of scales. I was trying to figure out the meaning of this when I heard a voice coming from among the four living beings. Remember the four living beings? They have four faces and they're before the throne. And this uh, being has an uh, eagle and a man and a lion and a, and a calf, the four faces. This is one of the four living beings. Uh, four living beings. And he was saying, wheat and barley will be scarce. It will cost a day's wages for one quart of wheat or three quarts of barley. But the drought will not hurt the oil or the sweet wine of the grapes. True believers will be few, but faith and love will not die out. Revelation 6 verses 5 and 6. Talking now about the, the, the uh, black horse. And uh, so now we have this black horse, op the very opposite of the white horse. It's a period of great darkness and moral corruption in the church. It's just getting worse and worse. Uh, the darkness that fell upon that church was actually started in the previous uh, church or the previous horse. Uh, it was uh, J.D. Woodhouse who said this, this in a book titled The Apocalypse. He says, as the stream of Christianity flowed farther and farther from the fountain or, you know, from its source, it became more and more corrupt. As the centuries advanced, superstition advanced with them. Tales of purgatory and pious frauds and the worship of saints and relics and images took the place of pure and simple Christianity till at length the book of God was laid aside for legendary tales and traditions of men. All these corruptions were collected into a regular system of superstition and oppression. Uh, he has a tremendous insight there. What a fit emblem is the uh, scales in the writer's hand. Why is this writer carrying scales? 
One reason was because the church has become so connected with the state that it's confusing as to who's running the place. It's confusing. There's a, there's a, a balance there. The book of Daniel talks about scales. Remember the scales in the book of Daniel? It was in the time of Belshazzar. Nebuchadnezzar is gone now. And Belshazzar is actually Nebuchadnezzar's grandson. And Belshazzar has this feast. Remember this feast. And uh, he has all of his concubines and his wives and his uh, political uh, friends. And he's in Belshazzar's palace. And Daniel took time to scold. He actually scolded Belshazzar. Because he said, you should know better. Your grandfather, you saw him living out in the pastures as a cow for seven years before he was converted, before he finally understood that God is in control of everything. (laughs) Uh, Nebuchadnezzar living out in the fields, but Belshazzar did not learn the lesson that God is in control. Listen. And you, this is Daniel speaking, (laughs) to the king. I mean, this is Belshazzar. And you, Belshazzar, are his grandson, Nebuchadnezzar's. You knew all about this, and yet you did not put a check on your own pride. You let it get the best of you to the point that you showed no respect for the God of heaven. You ordered the cups from God's holy temple in Jerusalem to be brought in so you, your officials, your wives, and mistresses could drink from them. Then you praised your gods of gold and silver and bronze and iron and wood and stone, which can't see or hear or know anything you're doing. But the God of heaven, who knows everything, who holds your breath in his hands, you insulted and ignored. So God sent this hand to write this message. Tekel, you have been weighed on the scales of heaven and found lacking. So scales, this is not the first time we've ever heard of scales. Uh, Belshazzar was mixing up his gods. He had chosen the wrong god to follow. He was running a nation by his own rules. And he should have known better uh, because he should have seen his grandfather and known that there is a god who rules all nations. The third horse of Revelation, the black horse, demonstrates the very same problem. The church is being run by the wrong power. And it is being weighed on the scales of heaven, and we find that it is lacking and coming up short. This is, this is the time of, uh, of the black horse, the, the third church. The third horse of Revelation. From the book, Seer of uh, Patmos, Haskell writes once again, the church during the fourth and fifth centuries began dictating to men what they should believe and how they should worship. This was the period when Christianity was replaced by the papacy and men, and man was exalted as vicegerent of God on earth. Now, the word vicegerent means uh, an appointed person who is a representative of God or Jesus on earth. And a, a lot of times they were self-appointed. <laughs> uh, and so uh, the church during the period, this period in history is becoming more and more concerned about the, the concerns of the nation, that is the political things, rather than the things, the spiritual lives of its church and its people. So you can see it slowly happening. The time frame here for this horse and rider is from about 313 to 538, which is the beginning of the Dark Ages. The Dark Ages around 538, one of the most extremely dreadful periods in the history of our world. It says a drought accompanies this third horse. There's a literal drought that God allows, allows this horse Uh, as he comes on to the scene. But the drought has two meanings. There's a drought, of course, the the barley and the wheat are really, 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 really expensive. But there's also a drought of God's Word because the people were not allowed to read it. For one, it was written in Latin, and most people didn't know Latin. 
And for another, the Bible was very uh, guarded. It was guarded in the church, in the, in the uh, temple or the sanctuary or the church of that time. And so people were not allowed. Uh, the, the, uh, the, the preacher or the priest stood front and told the people what the, the Bible said. They weren't allowed to read it for themselves. There is talk in this period of a time about the quart of wheat for a denarius or a penny. A denarius was a day's pay, so you could get a quart of wheat for a day's pay. So there was a, a, a tremendous drought going on. If you could buy only one quart of wheat for a whole day's pay, you were going to starve, especially if you had a family to feed. As far as the barley is concerned, you could get three quarts, but barley was not uh, nutritious like wheat was. Barley was the food of the poor people. Barley was fed to the livestock, as a matter of fact. Uh, in his book titled Revelation Pure and Simple, Kenneth Cox writes, as a comparison in ordinary times, a denarius would buy 24 quarts of barley. 24. Uh, we are not finished with the third horse and rider yet. The living being on the throne said, and do not harm the oil and the wine. Uh, what is the third living being talking about here? Uh, it would seem that oil and wine are kind of, a, kind of a luxury during a drought. But we need to define the terms. I like what John Pauline once again says. He says, if the black horse is seen as the opposite of the white horse, the passage is describing a spiritual famine, a famine of God's word, the bread of life, and also for Jesus himself. Since the oil, representing the Holy Spirit, and the wine, representing the blood of Christ, are symbols of God's grace, the famine in this seal is not... It's not spiritually fatal because serious as the famine is, the symbols of God's grace are still available. The symbols of God's grace are always available. The, the wine or the, the oil representing the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit is always available. We just need to ask for Him. So even if there is a drought, the Holy Spirit's available. God's grace is available. Always. <laughs> When we celebrate communion, we use bread and grape juice, symbolizing wine, symbolizing uh, the blood of Jesus shed on the cross for us. So even though the church has, has become a, a persecuted thing, <laughs> uh, entity, the gospel of Jesus, through the work of the Holy Spirit, uh, has never been lost. There were faithful people preserving God's word and God's work all through the dark ages, but an even darker time is coming in this next horse. We need to stop there for today. We will finish with the last of the four horse, horsemen next Sabbath. The fourth horseman takes us through the time coming, uh, the darkest periods of earth's history. Um, when the truth in God's word is kept from people and the devil will fill the void with corruption, superstition, uh, immorality, and false teachings of all kinds. These are just a few of the many attributes of that dark, of that dark time in our history um, during the Dark Ages. And, and if you come next week, we'll learn some more about those Dark Ages and what they were all about. Thank you.